it's okay to start now or if we need to wait? I guess that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the last talk for today um, is by Sabia Mukherzi uh, from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And Sabia is going to talk on David homeomorphism in analysis and dynamics. Thanks very much. All right, thanks Wasu for the introduction and thanks to the organizer for giving me this chance to speak in the conference. I wish I could have been there in person. But anyway, so I know that people are going out for lunch and going for lunch and going out kayaking. So I'll try to keep this um, short and simple. I'll certainly not go over time. So, okay. So, um, so this talk is going to be um, about some applications of the with homeomorphisms in both complex analysis and complex dynamics. And it's based on joint work with Misha, Lubitsch, Sergey Marenko, who's probably in the audience, and Mohan, MJ, and um, Demetrius. Uh, so some precursors to this particular talk, I mean, one could find some precursors to this particular talk in Sergey's talk. So let me start with some motivation. So roughly speaking, the, the, uh, the underlying motivation for much of this is a, a desire to prove certain combination theorems in, in dynamics or groups, etc. So let me start with some combination theorems, some classical combination theorems. Uh, probably in the complex analytic category, the first combination theorem that uh, was proved was by Lip and Burs, who proved what's now known as the simultaneous uniformization theorem, where you take two points in the Teichmuller space and you want to construct some sort of an object that simultaneously uniformizes the two surfaces, um, that, that, that uniformizes the two different surfaces simultaneously. So what do I mean? I'll just, I'll not give any kind of precise statement, but roughly speaking, we know that surfaces can be uniformized by actions of function groups on disks. So if you take some function group action gamma one on the disk and another function group action gamma two on the disk, then this uniformization theorem tells us that there exists um, a group gamma that is no longer function, but it's a discrete subgroup of PSL2C, so it's a Kleinian group whose limit set is some quasi-circle, no longer a round circle, and the action of gamma on the interior, or let's say on one of the complementary components of the limit set, is conformally conjugate to the action of gamma, let's say gamma one on the disk, and the action of gamma on the other complementary component is conformally conjugate to the action of gamma two. So you construct a group that simultaneously behaves like gamma one, and gamma two in two different parts of its dynamical plane. So you manage to put them together, that's the combination. And uh, the main tool that goes into the proof of this theorem is the measurable Riemann mapping theorem because function groups are quasi-conformally conjugate. So it's natural to use quasi-conformal techniques and measurable Riemann mapping theorem essentially gives uh, the existence of this particular quasi-function group. There's an analog of this particular theorem in complex dynamics, which is probably well known to everyone here. If you take two Blaschke products, say B1 and B2, both acting on the disk, and both of them have, say, some fixed point, attracting fixed point in the disk. So the dynamics of the Blaschke product B1 is very simple. Every point in the disk just converges to this attracting fixed point. And the same is true for the Blaschke product B2 all points converge to some fixed point inside the disk. And let's assume that they have the same degree. So you take two Blaschke products with attracting fixed points of the same degree. And you can ask the same question. So in some sense, um, according to the Sullivan dictionary, Blaschke products are the right analogs of function groups because these are global dynamical systems that restrict to the round disk. Um, and what you want is to construct a rational map which is much like a quasi-function group in the sense that you want its Julia set to be a quasi-circle and you want the dynamics of the rational map on one component, one for two component to be conformally equivalent to B1 and its dynamics on the other 
a two component to be conformally equivalent to B2. And this is possible. It's possible due to, again, the measurable Riemann mapping theorem, but also importantly, the Alfors building extension theorem. So although this is again, probably well known to everyone, I'll just say a word. Um, the, the key idea of the construction here is to take a topological conjugation between B1 and B2, and the fact that they are both expanding Blaschke products, they're both expand, expanding on the Julia set, tells you that the topological conjugation between the B1 action on the circle and the B2 action on the circle is actually a quasi-symmetry. And hence, you can extend it to a quasi conformal map of the disk by, say, Alfred building extension. And that's what allows you to construct a quasi-regular model of this map R, and then you straighten it. So all of that is simple by now, provided you have a quasi-symmetric um, conjugation. So this particular um, approach doesn't directly work if you have a parabolic fixed point on the boundary. All right, so at this point, one can ask two questions. How do I go beyond the idea of, um, beyond expanding maps? If I want to com combine stuff and say both of them are not really nicely expanding, or maybe one of them is expanding and the other one is not so expanding, how do I try to put them together? Because I can no longer use stuff like Alfred's building extension theorem. So some answers in that direction, or answers to this particular question were given by Pesinski in the um, in early 2000, I guess, where he used uh, the idea of the homeomorphisms that allow one to go from a repelling fixed point to a parabolic fixed point, or more generally to go from, um, or if you think about it this way, it allows you to go from expanding dynamics to expansive dynamics with, in the, with the presence of parabolics. Although he uh, restricted attention to, I think, mostly polynomial dynamics, the analysis of Hasinski is subtle. It requires close understanding of how to change Koenig's coordinate to for two coordinates and so on and so forth. And in general, cannot be generalized. Uh, for the application that we have in mind, Hysinski's techniques won't go too far. They, they, they won't give us much. So I'll come back to this point. The other question that one can ask is, how can we try to combine these two operations? Here we have a combination theorem purely in the context of group theory, Kleinian groups. And here we have a combination theorem purely in the context of um, complex dynamical systems, but both of them are complex, well, purely in the context, context of rational maps. Is there a chance, if you believe in the Fatou Sullivan dictionary, is there a chance of constructing some kind of a dynamical system where you can combine a function group with a Blaschke product? So this question um, is slightly ill-defined because of the following reason. Oh, well, I'll come to the following. Let me actually, um, I forgot what my next slide was. So I'll come to the answer to this particular question in a little bit. But before that, let me say what David homeomorphisms are because uh, the David homeomorphisms are going to play a crucial role in this talk. So I think this was defined by Sergey in his talk. So I'll just recall the definition. So you take two open sets, U and V in the sphere, and let sigma be the spherical measure. You say that, a map from U to V is a David homeomorphism, uh, an orientation preserving homeomorphism is a David homeomorphism, provided it lies in this overlap class W11 locally. And the Beltrami coefficient, which is allowed to go close to one, does so if it's allowed to go close to one, but the area of the region where it's going close to one decays exponentially. So that's it. So essentially, all, all quasi conformal maps are obviously the width. Uh, you can find some epsilon naught so that they're actually bounded. You don't need any, the, the area of the region where the Beltrami coefficient is larger than, let's say, one minus epsilon naught is going to be zero. So this is trivially true. Here, you allow the Beltrami coefficient to go to one, but on a very small set, on sm smaller and smaller, exponentially shrinking sets. And the reason why this class of maps is interesting or useful is the following integrability theorem by Guy David, which states that if you take a 
what we call a David coefficient. So that's just a measurable function which satisfies this condition. So by if you replace mu h with mu, if mu satisfies this condition, namely the area of the set where the Beltrami coefficient goes to one, has area shrinking to zero exponentially, then such a, a measurable map is called a David coefficient. And David proved that given such a mu on the sphere, there exists a homeomorphism H in the correct class that solves the Beltram equation with the, with the given um, coefficient mu. And moreover, it's actually unique up to, up to Mobius transformation. So this is the a generalization of the measurable Riemann mapping theorem for Beltrami coefficient satisfying this, this property. Okay, so since we have a David integrability theorem for a certain class of an integrability theorem for a certain class of Beltrami coefficients, one can then go back and ask whether we can use this David integrability theorem to prove stronger statements. So whenever we have a setup where the measurable Riemann mapping theorem can be used to perform certain surgery in a similar setup, but maybe in a similar, slightly more complicated setup, can we use the same principles? But now, even if quasi-conformal surgery does not work, can we use the same principles with quasi-conformal replaced with the weak? That's the general question. Okay, so that's sort of um, the, a vague answer to this question. This will turn out to be an answer to this question, how to go beyond expanding. If you want to go beyond expanding, allow parabolic points, then you have to go from quasi-conformal to the V. On the other hand, the question about how to combine these two different worlds is, is more subtle. There are multiple ways of doing it. So for instance, today I'll only be talking about combination theorems um, in the context of maps, there's another particular context where matings of rational maps and Kleinian groups or Fuchsian groups arise. That is the context of algebraic correspondences. I will not talk about correspondences today at all. So what do we want to do now? On, what is the incompatibility between a group dynamics and the dynamics of a rational map? Well, on the group side, you have invertible objects. And on the rational map side, you have a semi-group, which is def defined by a non-invertible rational map. So what does it mean to try to combine a semi-group dynamics with, with a group dynamics? So the solution that we are going to propose, and this appears naturally in many contexts, is the following. You sort of make them meet halfway. You start with a group, and you cook up a group, uh, cook up a map, sorry. You cook up a map from the group. The first construction of this sort goes back to Nielsen, where he defined implicitly what's called the boundary developments. But in more recent literature, it was Rufus Bowen and Caroline Series who actually introduced certain maps on the limit set of a function group that in principle captures the dynamics of the function group. So let me make that slightly more precise. Given a function group, given a function group, or, or more generally also a reflection group, you want to define a piecewise Mobius map or a piecewise anti-Mobius map on the limit set, on the circle, that has two properties. A, you want this map not to forget the group completely. So on the limit set, you want the group orbits to equal the grand orbits under this map. So as far as think of flow lines, here's a, there's, a, there's a group and there is a map. The flow lines of A and the flow lines of gamma are gonna be the same. The whole orbits of gamma and whole orbits of A are gonna be the same. The fine dynamics are obviously gonna be different, but as orbits, they are both going to have exactly the same orbits. And this is what is called the uh, called orbit equivalence between a map and a group. And this was introduced by Bowen and series. However, this map that we want from the circle to the circle is not only going to be, uh, we, we, we also want this map to sort of be compatible with polynomial dynamics. If you want to, if you want to combine a polynomial or a Blaschke product with a function group, you want this particular, you want to construct a map that remembers some of the group structure, but also has some similarities with a polynomial. And that's what we are looking for. We want to construct a map that is topologically z to the d or z bar to the d, depending on whether we are in the holomorphic or anti-holomorphic setting, 
on the circle. And it, we want it to be orbit equivalent to the group. And as I said, examples of such maps uh, be, were given already by Nielsen in the 1930s and by Bauer and Sirius probably in 1978 or something. So let me give two simplest examples. The first one over here on the left is an anti-holomorphic example. So here you take what's called the ideal triangle group. You take three circles, the red, blue, and the green ones, three geodesics in the, um, in the disk, in the Poincaré disk, which define um, an ideal triangle. And the group generated by these three reflection is just a free product of three copies of Z mod two. And you define a map, not on the whole plane, you, you're not going to define a holomorphic map on the whole disk, because then you're going to get a Blaschke product. You want to define a map on a subset of the whole disk, namely everything except the fundamental domain. Here, the map is defined as reflection in this red geodesic, also on the circle. And in this region, on this half plane, your map is defined as reflection in this blue, and on this half plane, your map is defined as reflection in the green circle, on the green geodesic. So this is going to be a map that is, it's a, it's a partially defined map. It's a map from a subset of the disk onto the disk. It's not hard to see that this map is topologically conjugate to Z bar squared on the circle. That's because this red arc is mapped to the union of the blue and the green and the blue is mapped to the union of the red and the green and so on. So you get a simple Markov partition, which is compatible with the Markov partition of the map Z bar squared given by the third root security. So topologically, this map is simply Z bar squared on the circle. Moreover, it's a simple exercise to check that the grand orbits, so the grand orbit of any point on the circle under the reflection group is the same as the grand orbit um, of the point under this Nielsen map that I just defined. On the holomorphic side, there are instructions, as I said, by Bobbin and series, and they actually introduced these maps in order to study properties of the geodesic flow on surfaces. Um, they mostly considered closed surface situations, and in closed surface situations, these maps are never continuous, let alone being topologically z to the d. But it turns out, if you adapt their construct construction, if you adapt the bound series construction in the case of a punctured sphere. So if you take a punctured sphere in this particular case, I have what I have drawn here is the fundamental domain of a surface of a, of a four times punctured sphere, zero genus, four punctures. And the fundamental domain is given by this hexagon. What are the side pairing transformations? You have a group element G1 that takes this red to that red. And similarly, there's G2 and there's G3. And if you fold over, you are going to get a surface with four cusps. There's one cusp here, one cusp there. These two points give you one cusp and these two give you the fourth cusp. And the bound series map is defined as G1 on this half plane, G2 on this half plane, G3 here. And it's gonna be G3 inverse there because the side pairing transformation that takes this edge to this, this one is, is simply G3 inverse. So it's gonna be G3 inverse and G2 inverse here and G1 inverse there. So simple minded map, but they allowed, they, the point was, the point for Bowen and series was to use this map to study the geodesic flow. And they managed to show that the geodesic, certain properties of the geodesic, geodesic flow can be reduced to ergodic theoretic properties of this map itself. However, we are not going to, and the reason why they could do that is that the map was actually orbit equivalent to the group. So the map, which is defined by this formula on the circle is it, it, its grand orbits are the same as the grand orbits of this function group uniformizing the four times punctured sphere. So here is another example of a map that is orbit equivalent to a function group. And clearly the map that I have just defined is topologically Z to the five. It's a map of degree five that is expansive covering. You can see it the following way. If you um, look at the map, so it sends this red arc to that red arc. So in particular, it's going to send this circular arc all the way here. Then if you go from here to there, the map will continue like this. So each piece covers five pieces. 
which is what tells you at the end that it's a, an expansive map of degree five of the circle. So it's topologically conjugate to Z to the five. So these are two simple examples of maps that are orbit equivalent to groups and topologically conjugate to um, Z to the D on the circle. Now, going back to the question of combining objects of this sort, one can ask a simple question. Is it possible to construct a conformal dynamical system that on one side behaves like a Nielsen map of a reflection group or the Bobbin series map of a Fuchsian group and on the other side behaves like a Blaschke product? And the main tool, it turns out to be the case, it turns out that one can indeed do that, but the main tool is a generalization of the Alpors building extension theorem. Because if I think of this map here, it's topologically z bar squared, but it's not quasi symmetrically equivalent to z bar squared. Because for z bar squared, these are repelling fixed points. Whereas for the map we have just defined, it's a reflection map. These are parabolic fixed points. Similarly, in this example, the map z to the five obviously is purely hyperbolic, purely expanding, whereas this point and this point, recall that they are parabolic fixed points of the group. So G1 and G, G1 inverse, these are parabolic elements in the Fuchsian group. So these fixed points have derivative one under the map. Therefore, the conjugation between z to the d or z bar to the d and these kind of maps are never going to be quasi-symmetric. You cannot use the, the argument of either the simultaneous uniformization theorem or the construct construction of a quasi blaschke product to construct these hybrid dynamical systems. Therefore, what you are looking for is a generalization of the, the alfors berling extension theorem. And let me state a theorem. Uh, this is a special case of a somewhat more general extension theorem for circle homeomorphisms that was proved in this giant paper with Misha, Sergey, and Dimitrius. Uh, I have only stated um, what, what I'll be needing for this particular talk. So you take, let me put it like this. You take a function, a map of the circle. It's a cir covering map of the circle that is expansive, piecewise analytic, and you also require it to be C1. In, the, in our actual theorem, we don't require it to be C1, but this is good enough for today's purpose. So how should I think of F? Well, F is a covering map that's piecewise analytic. For instance, like these guys, these are piecewise Mobius. C1, these are all C1 maps. One can easily check that. In fact, all it's piecewise Mobius. So the only points where C1 property needs to be checked are the breakpoints, but the breakpoints are parabolic. So the derivatives are just one. So it's easy to check that it's actually C1. And you also want it to be an expansive covering map of the circle. This expansive property comes from the fact that here, for instance, you have a reflection map and the reflection map on this shorter arc of the circle is expanding. It's, it's parabolic at these two points, but on the interior, it's actually expanding. And if you have something like an expanding map or something whose derivative is at least one everywhere on the circle and equal to one only at a at a finite connection of fixed points, it turns out to be an expensive map. It's, it's an easy thing to check. So these are the examples of the, uh, of the map F that's appearing in this theorem. Um, and you also want this map to satisfy um, a complex Markov property. I don't want to state this precisely, but what do I roughly mean by the complex Markov property? I mean the following. Here, I have a Markov partition given by the pieces of the map. And the red guy maps to the union of the blue and the green. A complex Markov party property would be to say that there is a complex neighborhood of this Markov partition piece, which maps to some complex neighborhoods of these Markov pieces. And that's indeed the case. The image of this circle, if you extend this red jodice and get the whole disk over here under reflection, its image is certainly going to be an open set containing the blue and the green. It's going to be everything outside of this red disk. So the Markov property that the image of a Markov partition piece covers the other guys, we want it 
to be extendable to some complex neighborhood. But if you have such a map, for instance, any of these two maps, then uh, it's a standard fact that an expansive covering map of degree G of the circle. Um, hmm, I think I should have, I should say something like a mod D here because I'm also allowing orientation reversing circle coverings, which would have degree negative D or a negative integer. So if depending on whether the map F is orientation preserving or, or orientation reversing, they are necessarily topologically conjugate to either Z to the D or Z bar to the D. And the statement is that if you pick such, an, such a conjugacy, an orientation preserving homeomorphism of the circle that conjugates this map to F, then it extends. The map is no longer quasi-symmetric, but it extends to a global David homeomorphism. In particular, it extends to a David homeomorphism of the disk. Okay, so in whatever time I have left, um, I'm going to say a few words about applications of this theorem into various combination problems and also to problems um, where one can go from in not necessarily just combination problems. Our general goal is to start with a hyperbolic dynamical system, an expanding dynamical system, and change it into a parabolic dynamical system. Applications would include going from hyperbolic anti-rational maps to parabolic anti-rational maps, to go from anti-rational maps to reflection groups, and to also produce hybrid dynamical systems that can be thought of as combinations of polynomials or antipolynomials with function or reflection groups. In fact, this theorem can also be proved, can, can also be used to prove um, a, um, a generalization of the, of the class of bullet Penrose correspondences. So I'll not be talking about today. Let me just mention that another application of this theorem would tell us that bullet Penrose type correspondences exist in every degree but that's not the topic of today's talk, so I'll not get there. Okay, so this slide is mostly about answering the question that was asked on, on the first slide. We wanted to combine two dynamical systems on the disk, one of them um, not necessarily Blaschke products, maybe partially defined dynamical systems, and not necessarily the, their boundary reactions, their dynamics on the circle are necessarily are not necessarily quasi-symmetrically conjugate, but we still want to put them together. So here's the statement. You take two maps, F and G. So again, examples, uh, what examples should you keep in mind? You can keep any of these examples in mind. You can keep uh, a Blaschke products either with an attracting fixed point in the disk or with a parabolic fixed point in the, on the circle in mind. Um, yeah, so think of two piecewise analytic C1 expansive covering map maps of the circle of the same degree. Since we are requiring that the maps are piecewise analytic, if these are Blaschke products, then they extend to the whole disk anyway. If they're not, if they are maps of the form, uh, if they are Nielsen maps or Bowen series maps, they still admit some complex extension. Like these maps extend to quite a big part of the disk. These are also well-defined everywhere outside a fundamental domain. So you want to say that if you take two such guys satisfying the properties of the, of the previous theorem, namely their piecewise analytic C1 expansive, and they satisfy the complex Markov property. Uh, I should comment that this complex Markov property is automatic if the map is piecewise Mobius, because, if, because, because of trivial reasons because Mobius maps send circles to circles. So this is, for all the examples that I have in um, my slides, this is automatically satisfied. The statement is that given two such dynamical systems, one can construct a conformal dynamical system with a Jordan curve limit set, such that the map extends to some neighborhoods, maybe, pinched neighborhoods of the of its Jordan curve limit set such that on one side, the dynamics is conformally conjugate to F and on the other side, the dynamics is conformally conjugate to G. 
And the proof is quite simple. Your goal is to start with two dynamical systems, maybe piecewise defined uh, and partially defined. And you want to glue them together. You want to think of them as a lower hemisphere and upper hemisphere and glue them together and put a complex structure on it. So what are you going to do? You start with the most hyperbolic object, namely say you're, you're in the um, hyperbolic, sorry, you're in the orientation preserving situation. So you take the map Z to the D on the circle. You know that both F and G are topologically conjugate to Z to the D on the circle. Therefore, there is a map H1 from this circle to that circle that conjugates F, uh, Z to the D to F. And the previous theorem tells us that this map extends to the width homeomorphism of the D. So there is actually a global um, a homeomorphism from the disk to the disk, which is non-dynamical on the disk, but on the circle, it conjugates C to the D to F. And there's a similar map H2 from the exterior of the disk to this guy, which is again, non-dynamical outside, but it conjugates Z to the D to G on the circle. Once you have these nice maps, the, the only thing that matters is that H1 is the Vig. So if you import the dynamics F, if you conjugate it and make uh, and create a dynamical system H1 inverse F H1 here and H2 inverse G H2 outside, these two trivially match up on the boundary because on the boundary, both are just Z to the D. And the point is, this is a generalization of a quasi-regular map. This is a David regular map because H1 is a David homeomorphism and H2 is a David homeomorphism. In particular, if you pull back the standard circle field by H1 and H2 to get some ellipse field here, then this ellipse field is going to satisfy the David condition. And hence, you can straighten this ellipse field to obtain uh, by some global David homeomorphism H to get a conformal map or a complex analytic map. The image of the circle under this David homeomorphism, which will be whatever it is, that's your red curve, that's the limit set. And the dynamics inside is going to be conjugate to F conformally, and the dynamics outside is going to be con conjugate to G conformally. So let me give some examples of this construction. If you take two Blaschke products, so in this particular case, let us take the same Blaschke product. But of course, if you take the same Blaschke product and mate it with itself in the trivial way, you get the Blaschke product back. So we are going to mate it with itself in a non-trivial way. What does that mean? This map has two fixed points, one and negative one. Both are parabolic fixed points. Um, yeah, right, I'm rising the right. Yes. One second. Yes. Uh, no, no, sorry, not both. both. Uh, yeah, that's correct. No. I'm saying this right. Yeah. So both are actually parabolic fits. One second, I made this image, right? No, they're both. I have to figure out what this means. Okay, so I'm taking this Blaschke product. It has two fixed points, one at negative one. Yeah, right. So here I have an attracting um, a repelling direction here and I have an attracting direction there. And if I made this map with itself so that I glue negative one with one and one with negative one, then I'm not going to get, get, a, get a Blaschke product. These two fixed points are going to give me two fixed points for the corresponding quasi Blaschke product. And this guy is going to have one attracting direction and one repelling direction, which is not the case for a Blaschke product. And here I'm going to get one again, one attracting direction from outside and a repelling direction. So Sorry. as such, yes. Sabia, are, are, the, yes. are the attracting and repelling directions definitely going in the right direction? Because I would have expected to have a sector in the attracting direction and have the cusp correspond to the That's repelling direction. That's something. a good point. That's a good point. Yes. No, no, you're right. I think the, the arrows are wrong. So all Thank arrows you. go the other way around. Okay. All arrows go the other way. Thank right. you. <laughs> this is the repelling Reassuring. direction. Thank you. This is the attracting direction, and this is the attracting direction. The zero angle is the repelling direction. You're right. Thank you. Yes. So as a rational map, it's not particularly interesting. This one, for instance, could also be constructed using the um, Hesinski's argument. 
But what what is different in this situation, what, what's, what's new at least, is that um, by our construction, we see that this directly, there's a, well, um, this can be constructed using this particular procedure and the Julia set, which has infinitely many cusps, have, well, infinity over two of them inward and infinity of over two of them outward is actually conformally removable because it's the, the image of a circle, a round circle under a W homeomorphism. And we prove that um, if you take a nice enough set, if you take a set that is removable for sobolev functions W11, then its image under a W homeomorphism is actually conformally removable. So this is the first example of, well, as far as we understand or know, now, this is the first example of a Jordan curve that's conformally removable yet has cusps in both directions. So usually if you have something that has cusps only in one direction of a Jordan curve, then the outside turns out to be, it's like a, it's like almost a quasi circle with cusps in only one direction. So the, one of the sides is a John domain and hence the, the Jordan curve turns out to be conformally removable. However, in this case, none of the domains is John. However, still the, the, the Julia set turns out to be conformally removable. In fact, using uh, this David surgery construction, um, one can prove a more general statement that the Julia set of any geometrically finite polynomial, if it is connected, it's going to be conformally removable because you can go from a hyperbolic polynomial to the geometrically finite polynomial and hyperbolic polynomial Julia sets are removable under uh, several functions, but I'll not say more about that. So, okay. okay, so um, the real new examples produced by the David surgery that I mentioned above are matings of maps and groups. So now let's take the simplest object Z bar squared in the anti-holomorphic setting and take the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group, which I explained earlier. So you have reflection here with respect to this circle and so on. Topologically, they are both Z bar squared. And it's easy to see that this map satisfies the properties of our, of our meeting theorem. So if you make them, you are going to get an anti-conformal or an anti-holomorphic dynamical system, not on the whole sphere, because the Nielsen map is not defined on this gray region. So whatever conformal dynamical system you're going to get by mating these things, is going to be defined only on a Jordan domain. It's going to be defined outside a certain triangle. Now, how can I try to understand what this particular dynamical system is? It's one thing to know that a conformal mating exists, but it's more desirable to understand what is the space of this conformal mating, of, of these conformal matings. So the answer lies in this small observation that the Nielsen map actually fixes these arcs, these circles, point-wise, because it's reflection in this circle and reflection in that circle and reflection in that circle. So the Nielsen map fixes the boundary point-wise and hence whatever anti-holomorphic dynamical system we get is going to be something that's defined outside this brown triangle, which is a copy of the gray triangle, and it fixes the boundary point-wise. And this is what's known as a Schwarz reflection map because these are real analytic arcs with some number of singularities. So locally at every point, you have a local Schwarz reflection map that maps the inside and the outside. It flips in inside to outside. And the point is that these Schwarz reflection maps extend to the exterior of the brown domain. So they extend all the way to the, uh, to the whole sphere minus the brown domain to give you a well-defined dynamical system. And that tells you that whatever the mating is, mating must be a Schwarz reflection. What's even better about these maps is that there is a simple characterization for Schwarz reflection. Namely, if you have a Schwarz reflection defined on a simply connected region, this is a simply connected region because we have glued the disk outside the disk, so we are in the sphere and the complement of the brown region in the sphere is simply connected. So our map, the mating is defined on some simply connected region. Let me write call that omega. Um, omega is the complement of the gray region. So there is some Riemann map from, 
the disk to this set omega. And it turns out that the existence of the Schwarz deflection map on omega, namely an anti-holomorphic map that extends to identity on the boundary, tells you that this rational map R, sorry, this Riemann map R extends to a rational map of the whole sphere. So this is sort of some sort of an, uh, a philosophy where um, you expect that when you mate two algebraic objects, obviously this map and this group or the map cooked up from the group, they're both algebraic objects and you glue them together. And when you glue two algebraic objects, it's only fair if the resulting object is also algebraic in some sense. And that indeed turns out to be the case because the Schwarz reflection map is given by on the circle, you oh, sorry, on the disk, you have the map one over Z bar, which is a reflection map. And the Schwarz reflection map, the mating is simply semi-conjugate to one over Z bar by this rational Riemann map R. So it's basically given by um, the inverse of the reflection of, of the Riemann map, which is the inverse of a rational map and then going by one over Z bar and then applying R. It is also an algebraic object it tells you and it gives you, oops, sorry. Sorry, I shouldn't have spoken about thing. Yeah, okay. So it gives you an explicit description of the space where the matings lie. Okay, here is another example. I'll not say much about it. Um, this is an example of a mating of a Blaschke product and the Nielsen group of the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group. And unlike in the previous case, here you see cusps here, but sectors outside, because in this particular case, um, the topological conjugation from here to there is still David, but it's a little less David than, than the previous example, because here all of them were repelling fixed points. All these fixed points were repelling, and here all these fixed points were parabolic. However, in this case, these are repelling fixed points. This is a parabolic fixed point though. And they are being matched to these guys, which are all repelling. So these two repelling fixed points are mapped to parabolics. However, this parabolic is mapped to a parabolic. So this in this part of, of the of this of the circle, the map is not so the V. It's more like quasi quasi symmetric, roughly speaking. Therefore, when you map uh, when you make them, you actually get a sector here and not a cusp. Okay, um, I'll. How much time do I have? Uh, seven minutes, I think. Seven minutes. Okay, fine. So I'll not get into uh, much more. Let me just say that so far I have been mostly talking about generalizations of the simultaneous uniformization theorem, where you map, where you try to combine two dynamical systems given on on the disk. Of course, there are more general combination theorems in complex dynamics. One can try to match two polynomials, which are not just maps on the disk. In group setting, one can talk about the double limit theorem where one makes more general Kleinian groups, groups on the boundary of the bell slice. Um, so one can ask, can our combination theorem also work in more generality? What if we take a group, a reflection group that's in the closure of the bell slice of the ideal polygon group, for instance, and a polynomial? So if you take this polynomial and this group, they have the right degree. This is a degree three polynomial, and this is. Um, a reflection group with, so I should say at least one word. What do I mean by mating this and that? Well, here I have a map acting on the Phil Julia set. What is the map here? The map here is pretty much the same as the Nielsen map. You have four circles and the group is generated by reflections in these four circles. So you come up with a map. The map just acts as reflection with respect to this circle here reflection with respect to this circle here and so on. And it turns out that one can indeed mate or combine the action of the Nielsen map of this group with the action of the polynomial over here, as long as there is no topological obstruction. So the general theorem that we proved in the paper is that given any post-critically finite, of course, more general statements can be made, but given any post-critically finite hyperbolic guy and uh, and a group like this, they are conformally matable. You are going to get some partially defined dynamical system in the, in the sphere, which is going to behave like 
P in some region and the Nielsen map of gamma on the other region, provided there is no topological obstruction. And as before, the mating is necessarily going to be a Schwartz deflection map. This is also an application of the David uh, surgery and David extension theorem, maybe a little bit on steroid. So um, let me end with some application in the holomorphic setting, because this is one part where um, so there are more open questions at the moment. So instead of trying to make the Nielsen map of the triangle group or the reflection group with an anti-holomorphic map, what if we actually take the bowing series map of a punctured sphere group? As I mentioned before, here is the same example that we had on one of the previous slides. This is the Bowen series map of a four times punctured sphere. The Bowen series map has degree five and it is both conformally, uh, topologically conjugate to Z to the five and um, it is orbit equivalent to the group itself. So on the other side, you take uh, maybe a Blaschke product of degree five, which is the same thing as saying you take a polynomial of degree five in the principal hyperbolic component. So you take a group in the Teichmuller space of a suitable punctual sphere and a polynomial map of a suitable degree in the principal hyperbolic component. So I, I'm just ensuring that both of them act on, on the disk. This guy acts on a Jordan domain. This guy acts on a part of a Jordan domain. But as before, I can glue them together. Our mating theorem tells us that one can glue them together, put a conformal structure on this topological mating and get some sort of a conformal mating. The question is what kind of conformal matings are these? And it turns out that just like in the anti-holomorphic setting where the matings were given by Schwartz reflection maps, which have something to do with rational uniformization, there's a similar description, although this proof is quite a bit more tricky, but there's a similar description for the matings of maps in um, well, polynomials, holomorphic polynomials, and Bowen series maps of punctured spheres. Um, they turn out to be, they turn out to be objects defined on, sorry, so the mating is going to look like something like that. Um, you have a map that's defined everywhere outside the fundamental domain of the Bowen series map and is going to behave like the polynomial outside and like the Bowen series map inside. And the domain of definition where the conformal mating is defined is once again, the image of a suitable domain under a rational map. But of course, now the map is no longer semi-conjugate to one over Z, it's semi uh, one over Z bar, it's semi-conjugate to one over Z. And the disc doesn't have to be a round disc anymore. It's any disc that's mapped inside out by one over Z. So this is a more complicated space of matings about which we don't understand a whole lot yet. And there are interesting questions that one can ask about these parameter spaces. So you take the space of all Bowen series maps of punctured spheres, made them with polynomials, say in principal hyperbolic components for simplicity. And you get a parameter space of matings, which is a product of a Teichmuller space and this hyperbolic component. And one can ask all kinds of questions. Um, one does not yet know what the compactification of several bare slices. So for a bare slice, if you fix a point here and the thing run on, um, and, and things run on the other part, uh, let's say either you fix a group and let the Blaschke products run, or if you fix a Blaschke product and let the groups run, these are going to give you slices in this entire mating locus. One does not know what the right compactification of these slices are. One does not know whether natural isomorphisms between the slices extend homeomorphically to the boundary. These are not expected to extend continuously because of discontinuity of straightening and complex dynamics and similar theorems by Thurston and Kirchhoff in the Kleinian group setting. Also, there are some interesting questions about Hausdorff dimension of these limit sets that one can ask. Namely, one doesn't, presumably these Hausdorff dimension, the Hausdorff dimension of these limit sets of the, of the limit set that we define here, Presumably, they, def they um, vary real analytically in the parameter. However, one should note that these are not quasi-circles. These are persistently parabolic slices. Another question that's, that presumably, that, that seems to be, a, uh, that seems to be quite interesting is the following. There's a theorem of Macmillan, which proves that the second derivative of the Hausdorff dimension of limit sets 
uh, have something to do with the whale peterson metric on rotational space and a similar pressure metric on hyperbolic spaces, on hyperbolic components. If one can ask whether the variation of the Hausdorff dimension of the limit sets of these objects have anything to do, or can they be written as some sort of a function of the whale peterson metric here and the pressure metric there simultaneously? Can one have, a, can, can one have a, an analog of, of this variational formula um, that encompasses both the, the rational world and the function world simultaneously. Okay, these are questions to which I have no answers, and thank you. Thank you very much, Savia, for the very interesting talk. Are there any questions or comments? All right. So just just a quick question, Savia. I mean, thank you. That's yeah. really really interesting, and, and looks like a really really nice result. Um, as a, I'd like to understand the um, e exactly so sort of where the the um, non quasi conformal nature um, sort of comes from in your constructions. Whether it's oh, is it only from the um, repelling to parabolic um, or not? So, so so in your in your kind of mating constructions here. Um, like the one with the bone series one or something. So, so, so if you if you had two analytic maps of the circle, covering maps of degree D, um, and they have parabolic points, but those parabolic points are kind of are the same for both maps and correspond to each other, and then then the conjugacy, I believe, will it's be quasi, quasi conformal. Yeah, yeah. So it's quasi, yes. it's, it's quasi symmetric. It will be it will be quasi conformal. So about your in your example, if you were going to mate instead of with the z to the d, you were going to mate with a Blaschke product which has parabolic points. Um, in the right places, um, would you then also be able to mate quasi conformally, or would you still need a David kind of homeomorphism? Uh, if you could find a Blaschke product with many, uh, so the problem is that if you have a Blaschke product, you cannot have. Um, so the problem is that if you have a symmetric Blaschke product, you cannot have a parabolic fixed point here and a parabolic fixed point there. So, so you so have too many measure, parabolic fixed points. In order you have to too many parabolic fixed but, points. But 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 still, sort of philosophically, it comes from having to having to. Made uh, made a uh, mix of uh, match up a uh, repelling one with a parabolic one. That's sort of the main thing. That that's exactly right. Okay, this is great. A, this Thank is a more philosophical question. In the rational world, we just cannot have too many parabolic fixed points. And whenever in all known examples of matings of maps and groups, both in this context and in the context of Burke, Penrose, and Luna, um, the group is always the parabolic group. There's just no way one can. There's there's no known example where one can meet, meet um, combine a convex co-compact object with a hyperbolic rational map and yeah i don't know why but it seems like every time you try to mate a group and a map on one side even if you take a hyperbolic rational map on the group side you are forced to take something with parabolics okay, thank that's you very much. Okay. yeah thank you uh i believe people are late for lunch so maybe if there are further questions or comments uh they can be communicated by email and we can maybe at this point thank our speaker again for the very interesting talk. Thank you. And thanks everyone uh, who gave a talk today. And I think people should go for lunch and stay happy.